But does the rain not fall equally upon all peoples? Does the sun not shine for all? And do we not all breathe the air in equal measure? Wherefore then are you not ashamed to recognize but three tongues, and command the other nations and races to be blind and deaf? These are the words that Constantine of Thessaloniki used against his Constantinopolitan detractors to defend the use of Old Church Slavonic, the language used to proselytize against the Slavs of Moravia. His Christianization work would signal the beginning of what is perhaps Byzantium's most enduring cultural and diplomatic legacy, the Byzantine Commonwealth. This was an extensive network of diplomatic, monastic and cultural exchange which saw the Eastern Roman Empire export its culture and religion across vast swaths of Eastern Europe and the Caucasus, a legacy that still exists in many countries in those regions today. Welcome to our video on the Byzantine Commonwealth, its long life and enduring legacy to the modern age. It's all well and good hearing about this, but why not go and see Byzantium for yourself this summer? Knowing some Turkish wouldn't go amiss for a smooth Istanbul experience, and that's where our sponsor Babbel comes in. It's a language learning app that specializes in real-world applications, such as all the stuff you need to enjoy travel. It's got short 10-minute lessons designed by real language teachers, no algorithms or AI, and they can be taken in many forms – online lessons, videos, podcasts or games. Istanbul is one of the most visited cities in the world, packed with relics from its centuries as a global center of power and culture. You can make navigating easy. Müze nerede? Müze nerede? Where's the museum? And all the basics are here too, and it makes sure you learn them with constant reinforcement throughout. Fortunately, Babbel is scientifically proven to get you up to speed in a new language in only three weeks, and if it looks like it's not going to happen for you, they offer a 20-day money-back guarantee. Even better, use our link in the description and get a 65% discount off of a Babbel subscription, and get ready for your adventures right now! The term Byzantine Commonwealth emerged in the 20th century, largely coined by Russian émigré and renowned Byzantist Dmitry Obolensky. Obolensky considered the Commonwealth to be a typical core periphery system, with Constantinople as the dominant power spreading influence to far outlying regions. Oblensky envisioned a system in which active Byzantine diplomacy allowed for the spread of the empire's cultural soft power. However, other historians, such as Christian Raffensperger, prefer the term Byzantine ideal. In this concept, Christianized states within Eastern Rome's orbit imitated Byzantine notions of kingship and prestige, but were not diplomatically bound to them. An example of this lies in Bulgarian Tsars such as Simeon, who openly aspired to be universal monarchs at the expense of Byzantium, and later Muscovite Tsars, who defied the will of Byzantium in the 14th century. In any case, when it comes to Byzantium's cultural impact on other nations, most scholars focus on the states of Eastern Europe, such as Bulgaria, Serbia, Romania, Ukraine and Russia, whose Eastern Orthodox faith is a direct result of historical contact with Eastern Rome. However, the Byzantine Commonwealth's reach goes beyond that, reaching into Georgia, Orthodox Christians in Anatolia and the Caucasus, as well as Hungary, Bohemia, Moravia and even Lithuania. Let us now explore how this Commonwealth worked and examine the cultural and diplomatic networks that emerged from its expansion. The beginnings of what would become the Byzantine Commonwealth emerged in the 9th century CE. During this period, the empire was occupied with many northern wars. Ever since the 6th century CE, Slavic tribes had been descending into the southern Balkans, pushed by nomadic incursions. These tribes had been quite troublesome for the Byzantines, who tried to subdue them by isolating them politically and converting them to Christianity. This had limited success due in part to the Byzantine policy of forced expulsions to break up Slavic tribal and kinship groups to erode political and cultural unity. However, while some tribes in modern-day Bulgaria and Serbia embrace the Roman god, there were many relapses into paganism, which the Byzantines considered rather detestable. In 862, major progress in Christianizing the Slavs was made when Prince Radislav of Moravia requested that evangelist scholars be sent to his realm to convert the people of his kingdom. To that end, Emperor Manuel III required scholars familiar with the culture of the Slavs. 
The ideal candidates were Cyril and Methodius, two brothers who were both literate and well-learned monks, and had spent a large part of their lives in multicultural Thessaloniki, where many Slavs lived. Ratislav's decision to invite Byzantine monks to his kingdom was politically motivated, as he sought political independence from the Franks, who had assisted in his ascension to power. Indeed, Frankish influence in Moravia was strong, and Cyril and Methodius faced struggles with rival proselytizers, German monastics from nearby Bavaria, who had influence in the region and preferred Latin liturgies. To compete with this, the two brothers worked to create the Glagolitic alphabet, which they used to translate a large corpus of biblical scripture into Old Church Slavonic, a language much closer to the dialects spoken by the locals than the Latin used by Frankish priests. The Glagolitic alphabet would later be adapted by the Bulgarians to create the Cyrillic alphabet many Slavic nations use today. In fact, Bulgaria would be one of Byzantium's largest diplomatic victories. When Emperor Boris was trying to break out of the diplomatic isolation born of his kingdom's pagan nature, both the Franks and the Byzantines swept in to compete over who would convert the Bulgarians. Eventually, Boris went with the Eastern Romans, and Bulgaria remains a predominantly Eastern Orthodox nation to this day. A similar pattern can be seen in the 11th century CE, when a Hungarian tribal leader called Gula II was baptized in Constantinople. While eventually both Hungary and Czech lands became Catholic, they still remained part of the Byzantine Commonwealth, both culturally and politically throughout the Middle Ages, albeit with less intensity than Serbia, Bulgaria and Russia. Sending monks or scholars to foreign lands was a staple of Byzantine diplomacy, and in doing so, Byzantine ideas of divinely ordained power and hierarchy were exported to neighboring nations. Byzantine cosmology often linked Neoplatonism with Orthodox Christianity, resulting in the Byzantines being depicted as God's chosen people, akin to the Israelites of the Bible. Byzantine scholars, particularly monastics such as Dionysius the Areopagite or John of Damascus, often legitimize Byzantine cultural supremacy using theology. The empire as a mirror of paradise is a common Byzantine literary theme, and this is also reflected in Byzantine art. Due to itinerant Roman monks, this philosophy soon spread to outlying lands and allowed various Eastern European kings to unify their kingdoms. For example, Bulgaria in the early Middle Ages faced strife due to a dualist religious movement known as Bogomilism. This was a Christian heresy which saw the material world as sinful and regarded church authorities with contempt. The Bulgarian Empire thus promoted the theological supremacy of their leaders to suppress the movement, a doctrine learned from Eastern Roman religious philosophy. As the Eastern Romans pushed religious ambassadors into foreign lands, so too did foreigners flow into Constantinople. The wealth of the Byzantine Empire was something that drew many of the pagan Slavic, Vlach or Katvelian peoples to the city of Constantinople. We have already discussed the appeal of Christianity to the medieval state of Kievan Rus in one of our previous episodes, whose Norse leaders saw it as the great city of Miklagard. Across medieval Eurasia, pagan peoples were not viewed favorably by many, so conversion to either Christianity or Islam allowed for better access to major Silk Road trade hubs, which were dominated by Islamic and Christian powers like the Caliphate, and of course Eastern Rome. Byzantium, being at the nexus of Silk Road trade, made Christianization extremely tempting for many pagan peoples. The prestige of Constantinople as a top travel destination amplified Byzantium's diplomatic power. When foreign dignitaries visited Constantinople, they were often treated with majestic receptions in places such as Hagia Sophia. This served to make foreign rulers want to emulate and be connected to a large and illustrious empire such as Byzantium, a partnership which came with many benefits for the rulers and their subjects, benefits like the aforementioned deployment of monks and scholars like Cyril and Methodius for local rulers to utilize, which provided the ability to build state and ecclesiastical apparatuses to unify their states. Marriage alliances were also common. Princesses like Simonida and Helena Palaiolohina, who married into Serbian and Muscovite royal families, or Anna Porfiroyanita, who married into the Kievan Rus's princely house, 
played important roles as both diplomats and as cultural ambassadors. While not all of the members of the Byzantine Commonwealth were orthodox, religion was one of the defining features of Byzantine-influenced nations. Many of the kingdoms that received Eastern Rome, such as the Rus, Serbia and Bulgaria, were linked via Byzantine Christianity. This gave rise to the belief among Byzantine elites that their domain was not linked to the lands controlled by the Emperor of Constantinople, but stretched to wherever Orthodox Christians lived. However, despite this pan-religious camaraderie, discrimination still existed, with Slavic peoples often considered to be barbaric in language compared to the sophistication of Greeks. Byzantine statecraft often served as one of the models of ascendant empires. This usually meant the legal and cultural unification of the state under orthodox-inspired emulation of Byzantium. For example, one of Bulgaria's most powerful monarchs, Simeon the Great, ushered a major era of cultural flourishing in the Bulgarian Empire. In fact, Simeon's reign is a testament to the fact that Byzantium was not the unquestioned leader in the Commonwealth. Simeon engaged in diplomatic and trade wars with Byzantium, and gained land from Byzantium, Hungary and Serbia. Simeon was very successful in his military campaigns, breaking off Prince Tomislav of Croatia's links with Constantinople via treaty. Simeon also promoted Slavonic literature, particularly via the Ored and Preslav literary schools. It was in these schools that the Cyrillic alphabet was formalized, replacing the Glagolitic script previously used by the Slavs. As a result of this, Bulgaria became one of the bulwarks of Slavonic literature throughout the Slavic-speaking world. Another interesting part of the Byzantine Commonwealth is the legal influence Eastern Rome had on its cultural satellites. The Byzantines, long considered to be major legalists since the time of Justinian, were useful as models of building unifying legal codes. In fact, Cyril and Methodius were some of the first writers of the Slavic Civil Code, a legal text harmonizing the laws of Moravia. Other figures, such as Sava the Illuminator of Serbia, merged local Serbian law and Byzantine law, forging a new legal code known as Zakono Provilo. There is also the factor of monasteries and mystics, which often united the disparate parts of the Commonwealth via cultural and theological production. A major center of this was Mount Athos in modern-day Greece. Originally a monastic center, the Holy Mountain began to welcome many monastic complexes from throughout the Commonwealth, as well as Catholics. Throughout the late Middle Ages, these centers produced monks who went on to found monasteries throughout the region. Graham Speak has termed this the Athonite Commonwealth. Figures such as John the Iberian and Ephthymios the Athonite, who hailed from Georgia, founded monasteries in the mountain and produced voluminous translations and scholarly texts. Through this, a common spiritual and philosophical network emerged, allowing for cultural bonds between the peoples of the Commonwealth. Sava the Illuminator, one of the most influential figures in early Serbian history, is also said to have come to the Holy Mountain many times to study and live an ascetic life. Upon his return to Serbia, he founded many bishoprics and monasteries precisely with the goal of Christianizing the whole of the country. His organizational and literary work was prolific and produced many great parts of Serbian classical literature. For this reason, after his death, Sava was made a saint, and his cultural legacy lasts in Serbia to this day. Beyond Athos, other monasteries throughout the Commonwealth often provided places for translation of Greek texts, such as the monasteries in Kyiv. Another interesting consequence of the Byzantine Commonwealth is the adaption of art and saintly cults in Eastern Europe. Byzantine art schools spread through the monasteries to the entire region, as did the cults of particularly popular saints. For example, military saints such as George, Demetrios and Theodore were often highly regarded in Byzantium, especially after Byzantine wars with the Islamic Caliphates. Their cults seem to have spread to the Rus, a state founded by warlike Vikings in a very organic fashion. In the Rus, the saints were seen and depicted as primarily warriors. This means that they appealed to the Rus princes specifically for their military prowess, not necessarily their religious fervor. The Catholic world was not passive to this Byzantine diplomatic and cultural network. We have already discussed the presence of Bavarian Ecclesiastes in the Czech lands. Slowly and over time, 
the presence and reorganization of the church structure shifted the power towards the Archbishop of Mainz, tilting towards Catholicism later on. In the north, Catholicism spread through Poland, while various chivalric orders spread Catholicism amongst the pagan population in the Baltics. In the Crusades, various Catholic movements occurred throughout the Balkans, even in Byzantium itself after the Palaiologian Restoration. These changes often had geopolitical reasons, such as the Treaty of Florence or the Treaty of Nymphaeon. Tensions then rose between Moscow and Constantinople for this very reason, causing rifts by the 15th century. Diplomacy was also used by the Pope in Bulgaria and Armenia. The Pope utilized the animosity between Byzantium and Armenian Cilicia and provided the Armenian kings with titles. This was the beginning of the connections between Rome and Armenia that would give birth to Armenian Catholicism. In Bulgaria, the Pope gave the Tsars legitimacy via the donation of banners and re-sacralization of the Bulgarian kingship. Many churches and peoples would often choose one side or another for their own protection or for political ends. Some communities, such as the Maronites in modern-day Lebanon, accepted the primacy of the Pope. This is actually a prelude to the appearance of many Eastern Catholic churches in the 15th to 16th century, which would be first used to bring Catholicism via Orthodox rites and then be persecuted by Orthodox empires. However, the synodic system of Orthodox Christianity often allowed for empires to stay Orthodox and clash or change geopolitical camps, such as Byzantium's turn to the West during the Ottoman incursions. The attempts of Byzantium to restore communion with Rome produced many fractures with the other major center of the Orthodox world, Muscovite Russia. The continuous wars in the Balkans and the eventual Ottoman conquest produced many fractures with the other Balkan Orthodox countries. In addition, the autonomy of each state meant that each took their geopolitical and cultural interests first. When Constantinople fell in 1453, the Commonwealth as a concept can be said to have ended, with other Balkan Orthodox countries being conquered by the Ottomans a few years later. However, the rum millet of the Ottoman Empire and the appeals of the Russian Tsars as protectors of Orthodoxy in the early modern period can be seen as descendants of the bonds of the Byzantine Commonwealth. The ecclesiastical artistic links of Eastern Europe are still evident in churches throughout the region. Each member of the Commonwealth acted as its own agent both during and after the Commonwealth's end, but the cultural developments and connections that were ushered by these networks, regardless of whether a country stayed with Constantinople or Rome, have built lasting links that survive to this day. More videos on Byzantine history are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.